you mention uh, schools and hospitals, um, yet more. <laughs> There's so many problems in this country, it seems. Um, let's move on to the National Health Service. Um, it strikes me that the NHS has become a sacred cow, as, as you've mentioned previously. Um, is it like the banks back in 2008, that it is just too big to fail? No, nothing is too big to fail. In fact, it's already failed. It's bankrupt. It was set up wrongly as a Ponzi scheme. It was pretending to be national insurance. If members of various shades of government over the last 50, 60 years had been directors of an insurance company, they'd be in jail by now. It was never set up as an insurance company. It was a Ponzi scheme. And the Ponzi scheme is defined as something that means that the people who are actually benefiting now are paid for by new people coming in. We've now got a diminishing population of people because the baby boomers are actually passing through the economy. And so they're not contributing as much as there has been. And the only way that this can actually be funded is by actually increased taxation or printing more money, both of which are ruinous to the country. The NHS is, is bankrupt. And until the major parties accept that, and there's no good actually just going, and we've seen this in Copeland, they, the, the Labour Party went and said, save our NHS. Well, effectively, you're talking about a 1950s bureaucratic Stalinist organisation that has been covering up for years for its mistakes. It has three billion pounds worth of claims against it from, from people for me medical ne negligence. It just can't go on. There has to be a quite simple way of actually taking medical provision out of the hands of, of, of if I can just finish this point, uh, uh, out of the hands of politicians who are using it like a political football and literally setting up my personal view and this is a personal view and it's not been um, endorsed by the party as yet but literally it ought to be medical health service needs to be actually set up similar to the Bank of England it's at arm's length mm -hmm. uh, I mean there's no two ways about it government does influence the Bank of England but at least they've actually got the ability to act independently and make decisions that way at the moment anybody who actually pays national insurance or their taxes and say well I've paid my taxes I'm mm -hmm. entitled to this I'm entitled to that it's not ring fenced. It all goes into general taxation. So if you, th it's like road tax. If you think all the money that you pay on your your car tax goes to maintain the roads, it doesn't. No. It's been providing paying for wars and other useless um, government programs over the last 50, 60 years. The money um, that is going to provide um, the welfare system uh, of the NHS really needs to be actually set up as a separate fund. In effect, uh, there are everybody just says, "Oh, you can't touch our NHS." Look what happens in America, where there are people dying in the streets and this, mm -hmm. that, and the other. That is an extreme argument to have. There are hundreds of different national insurance schemes across the world which all work, and you don't see people dying in the streets. We've also got to examine whether. Instead of just parking our old people onto the state once they've actually, and I have a vested interest in this, uh, uh, of parking your of, of your relatives on onto the state and sticking them in a, in a, a home where they're probably not looked after very well, and there's been plenty of examples mm. of abuse, is whether we all ought to, and this is the other side of libertarianism, is where we need to accept personal responsibility for our old and our young yep. and our children and their education and actually be more active in actually saying, right, how, how much do we value this? Um, I think the only provision that is actually going through as far as government is, is hoping at the moment that this problem will fade away in 20 years when people like me and the other baby boomers just, you know, we would do the government a favour if we all dropped dead tomorrow morning. Yeah. If all baby boomers born from 1947 to 1965 all dropped dead, I'm sure things will be fine, but we ain't going anywhere. No. Um, due to advances in medical technology, probably some of us are going to be around for a good, good while longer yet. So, do you think the free market has a role to play in healthcare? Yes, of course. Uh, you know, the classic example I always uh, cite to people is, you know, cars and mobile phones. You know, when cars came about, not everyone could afford them. Same with mobile phones. But now you can pretty much have whatever you want at any price range, and there is something for everyone. And essentially, no one goes without. Really, you know, the the yeah. The, 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 the almost the poorest person in Africa can have the same mobile phone as the richest person 
wherever. In well, the world. as you know, I work a lot in Africa, and the one thing that startled me over, over the period of time I've been traveling out there and working out there is everybody and his dog seems to have a mobile phone. Yeah. It's wonderful, uh, and it's opening up the, opening up, up the world. And it's also improving people's standard of life yep. because food now can be moved to markets where there's you know somebody can ring up somebody instead of somebody driving for two to three days saying, "Well, we need this, that, and you know. So, you know that the way that I think that we ought to be actually moving towards is where it all went wrong, apart from setting the NHS up as a Ponzi scheme, was the fact that the NHS simply nationalised buildings that had been provided for by the rich as part of their input into society. They, you know, there was, in the 1870s through to 1910, there were hospitals springing up all over the place. There were schools springing up. And this was by voluntary subscription. It was by churches getting involved, community groups, trades unions were getting involved in this activity. And the local gentry, and, and they were always giving money or land and everything else. Mm -hmm. It was a community effort. The NHS just nationalised this asset right. and severed at that point the local connection between the school and the hospital. And we've got to accept that that system actually worked for 50 years. And now we've spent 50 to 60 years with um, nationalised with nationalised assets that were taken from local communities. And they're now saying, well, we've built all these wonderful hospitals. You've actually done these hospitals on uh, off-balance sheet financing, the fabled PFI, which now means that to actually change a light bulb, you're actually costing £460 <laughs> yes. to actually do it. Mm. But that is part of the contract. And literally, it's to keep it off-balance sheet. So it, you're never, ever going to actually have taxation equaling social provision. Mm. And at the end of the day, professional politicians are terrified to even start talking about NHS as a bust entity. The Sun newspaper, not everybody's fav favourite, has come out in the last two weeks and said, it is now time to have a rational discussion about this. Fair play to the Sun.